Amen. Would you take your Bibles, please, and turn in them to Paul's letter to the Romans and the fourth chapter. We are in Romans chapter 4, and as you're turning there, I hope you all have Bibles, and if not, look on with somebody, because that is our authority for all that we do from this pulpit. But as you turn there, let me just say, at the beginning of this new school year, sun shining outside, it's an exciting time to be alive, and it's particularly an exciting time to be alive as a Christian in our society today. Because I believe that not in the last couple of centuries has the contrast between the true good news of Jesus Christ And every other religion has that contrast ever been so stark as it is today. Not ever before in Canada has true Christianity stood in such stark contrast with our prevailing culture. Now, I know we've got young people and young adults here, young families, and you may be discouraged right now. 2024, you look around and see the challenges that you face today and in the foreseeable future. You have questions like, how can you ever afford a home? What career path can you get that will pay you enough that you can have the things, not to be rich, but simply to live comfortably as your parents' generation did and the generations before? Or you have young families and you're concerned about the world as it is and and what kind of world will your children grow up to inherit? What kind of world will they live in? What will be the state of world peace or lack thereof? And You look around and you're concerned. I don't blame you, but I also don't want to leave you there. Because I believe firmly that you, me, all of us have been born and raised for such a time as this, right now. This is no accident that we are alive in this corner of the world at this time in history. Christ is building his church. Do you believe that? He promised that he would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against him. And people are right now all around us watching the thin veneer of civilization chipping away, not even very gradually, And there is an opportunity right now for the church of Jesus Christ to make an impact on this weary, frightened society as the church has not made in generations. And yet for that impact to happen, you're going to need to know what you believe as a Christian. You're going to need to be bold. You're going to need to resist going with the flow. And you're going to need to know what it is exactly that you believe as a Christian. You will need theological precision because in a society that's hungry for hope, with a dearth of hope around, there will be many counterfeit gospels peddled. We see it today. It's nothing new. But there will be more and more of a kind of Christianity that sounds good at first and appeals to the senses, but it's not rooted in biblical truth. And let me say, cotton candy Christianity cannot sustain someone's hope, let alone save a needy soul. The people around you need Christians who know what they believe and can share that truth with them. And I say all of that to introduce why we are back in Romans again in this letter of Paul. Because there is nowhere else in the Bible where Christian theology, the good news of Jesus Christ, is so systematically laid out in one place, as in this book, the letter to the Romans. And it's dense, as we talked about last week. This is a dense book. That's why we're taking it one piece, one chapter at a time. We took a break after chapter 3 some time ago, but in the interests of equipping you for a life of impact in this world, as you know God better and better and better, that's why we are back in Romans, and today we begin chapter 4 of this magnificent letter 
Please follow along with me. I will read the first eight verses, but we're going to concentrate this morning on the first five verses of Romans chapter 4. Hear the word of the Lord. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. This is the word of the Lord, and may he add his blessing to the reading of it. Now, chapter 4 of Romans begins with Paul having just rocked the world of any typical first century religious Jew or pagan Roman He's rocked their worlds every bit as much as he would rock the world by what he's just said in the previous chapter of any typical human being who lives in our 21st century today. Take a look back at chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. Remember where he, we've been by looking here. Romans 3, 21 to 22. He writes, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. So what he said there in chapter 3 is that we are saved as gift by God's grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ accomplished in history. And since that saving work of God is gift, pure gift, then none of us has any reason for a pat on the back as if we've done anything to make ourselves right with God. He goes on to affirm that and, and intensify that in verses 27 and 28 of chapter 3. Take a look there. He asks rhetorically, then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By, by a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. So the righteousness of God comes through faith in Jesus Christ for all who, who believe. That's it. One is justified by faith apart from works of the law. The appropriate response is, what? See, that's the appropriate response, and I guess I have to tell you that that's the appropriate response, disbelief and wonder, because we've become so familiar with our Bible verses and the message that we've heard that we are saved by faith. From the time we are young children in Sunday school, we learn from the beginning, almost John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him that's it, will not perish but have everlasting life. And we grow up hearing that over and over and we sing the songs of faith. And for so many of us, we've become so inoculated to the wonder of the message that it doesn't rock us to the core as it should. Because the Christian gospel is a radical, one-of-a-kind message, friend. And we too often miss its radical nature. This past weekend, Pope Francis was in Singapore, speaking on Friday at a Catholic junior college, and he was talking to a crowd of young people there. 
And he was emphasizing the importance of interfaith, interreligious dialogue. I can understand that. He was at a multi-faith meeting of young people. Now listen to what he said while he was there. He asked the question, <clears throat> if people start fighting over whose religion is more important, or saying, mine is the true religion, yours isn't true, where does that lead? The Pope asked. Someone in the audience answered, destruction. And the Pope said, yep, that's exactly right. He said, all religions are a path to reach God. They are, to use a comparison, like different languages, different dialects to get there. But God is for everyone, he continued. And since God is for everyone, then we are all children of God. And then he goes on. But my God is more important than yours, he's dramatizing. Is this true? There is only one God, he said, and we, our religions, are languages and paths to reach God. Some seek some Muslim, some Hindu, some Christian, but they are different paths. Understood? Now, in saying these things, the current Pope of the Roman Catholic Church was contradicting the historic teaching of his own church. He was also obviously contradicting the message of the Reformers, the Puritans, and the Evangelical Christians of today, in fact, in saying those words, he was taking a stand outside the teaching of the Christian church throughout history. But he did stand in agreement with some. In fact, he stood in agreement with many by saying that everyone is a child of God, that you don't absolutely need to receive by faith the message of Jesus Christ, but you can reach God by choosing any pathway as long as you follow it sincerely by saying that it doesn't really matter which pathway you choose, you'll eventually get there somehow. By saying that, the Pope wasn't saying anything new, friend. He was taking his place with countless people inside the visible church ever since the Enlightenment and he was taking his side with the natural bent of every normal human being. Just do your best, you'll be okay, and no matter which pathway you choose, you'll make it to your own personal heaven. In our day, what do we believe as a society? That you are saved by what you do, by how you work, Certainly not by what you believe. So if you're a Muslim, you are required to perform the five pillars. If you are a Buddhist, your goal is to detach yourself from cares and worries. In fact, to ultimately dis extinguish your entire personality and dissolve into oneness with the universe. If you're a, a JW, Jehovah's Witness, or a Mormon, or a member of one of the cults, you believe that in order to be saved, you need to follow the self-appointed prophets who give you a list of things you must do, rules that you need to follow, clothes that you ought to wear. And if you're a completely secular person and you say, I don't believe in God at all, well, you still have religion, friend, because you need to find the group you want to fit in with, and then you follow the leaders of that particular group on social media to find out the causes you're supposed to support, the slogans you're supposed to memorize, and whatever penance you must offer in order to stay in a state of grace and find salvation within your crowd of people. Oh, there is nothing new under the sun. And as humans, we are always looking for something I can do, some way I can gain my salvation. And that's where Romans 4 comes in. Now let me give you a little bit of context in case you forget where Romans comes in in history. Paul is writing this letter to the group of Christians in the capital city of the empire, the city of Rome, a city that he likely has never been to, a church he didn't start, a church that's filled with many people who don't even know him personally. Now he's writing this letter 
for a couple of reasons. He's, he's preparing to make a visit there. He wants to go to Rome and encourage and strengthen the church. So he's writing to introduce himself, preparing the way for that. But he also is writing because one of the great reasons for that visit he's hoping to make to the city is because the Lord has laid on his heart a desire to take the good news of Jesus, the gospel, to uncharted territory. He has his eyes on taking the message of Jesus Christ and preaching it beyond Italy and to the very edges of the Roman Empire. He wants to take it to Spain. And he's hoping that by stopping in Rome, by building a relationship with the Christians there, that Rome and its church would become kind of a springboard, a support team, and a home base for his mission to Spain. But before he can go there and get their support to get him to Spain, Paul feels the need to lay out before the Roman Christians exactly the gospel that he teaches. Because in many of the places where Paul's been and taught, he's been misunderstood. He's been maligned. He's been unfairly attacked. He's been misrepresented. He's debated in synagogue after synagogue, and he, he knows the objections that people will have to his teaching. He knows the ways that people have misrepresented him to others. So he is writing the letter of Romans to lay out exactly what he believes before he gets to the city. And we are so blessed to have this letter with its systematic laying out of the gospel in one letter as it is nowhere else in all of Scripture. And in chapter 4, Paul is taking on a question that he knows is being asked right now by his readers as they finish up chapter 3, hearing this letter read. To put simply, in our text this morning, in verses 1 to 5 of chapter 4, Paul is answering, how can we who are guilty, condemned sinners escape the wrath of God, have our guilt taken away so that we are no longer under the just sentence of condemnation from a just judge? How can we get to salvation if there are no works involved? How is that even possible well, Paul answers the question by taking his readers to Scripture and to the experience of not just any person in Scripture history. He takes them to someone who is no less important than Abraham himself. Take a look at verse 1 of chapter 4. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? Now, this is brilliant, friends. This is brilliant because if you are worshiping at church in Rome, you're surrounded by all types of different people. It's a cosmopolitan city, obviously. There are Jews in your church who have converted to Christ out of Judaism. There are Gentiles who have been saved to Christ out of paganism. And when they came as Gentiles to faith in Christ, they were given the Old Testament, our Old Testament, their scriptures as their authority for what they believe. Then you look around your worship service here in Rome and you see also the curious, the skeptics of Jew and Gentile background. And for all of them, Abraham has a special place. See, Abraham was the acknowledged father of the Jewish people, so every Jew traces his ancestry back to Abraham. Abraham's also the one that God promised would be the source of blessing to the whole world through his offspring. So every non-Jewish Christian traces his or her, our spiritual ancestry back to him. In fact, Matthew, in his gospel, he begins the New Testament. The whole New Testament, the very beginning of the gospel of Matthew, as it's organized in our Bibles anyways, begins it with the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And how does the New Testament begin? Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, who we'll look at next week, the son of Abraham. Ah. So outside of Jesus himself, Abraham has massive importance. He's actually the most important person probably in the Bible outside of Jesus himself. And Paul is about to show his readers that his gospel teaching, that we are saved by faith and not by works, remember that's the question that's being asked, 
He's about to tell them and explain to them that this is no new message that he made up himself. It's no change of plan on God's part. This is the one way that God has always saved everyone who ever has been or will be saved in all of history. And there's no better person to turn to for support on that than Abraham, the fountainhead of the family of faith. So he asks the question, Paul does in verse 1, what then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? Now that last phrase is a little tricky, according to the flesh. It's tricky because we're not sure what the phrase is referring to, what it's describing. Is Paul specifically speaking to Jews in that phrase, referring to their Abraham as their forefather, according to the flesh, because they're biologically related to him? Or is he asking what Abraham was able to accomplish in getting right with God according to or by means of the flesh? What is it? Well, here's where context helps us. Verse 2 helps us understand. Paul continues on the thought. Verse 2, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. So Paul's focus there. What is Abraham, our forefather, able to accomplish according to the flesh? His focus is on what Abraham was able to do by his own physical exertion, according to the works of his flesh. Now, Paul's first readers, they've grown up with exactly the same worldview that you and I, we have all grown up with. Despite the fact that Amazing Grace is probably our favorite hymn, most people think contrary to the meaning of that song, that if only you do your best, if only you try your hardest, if you are like that little engine, you think I can, I think I can, I think I can, if you just keep plugging away, that somehow you will make it to heaven. Just keep trying. And for those people in, Abraham, in Paul's first audience, just as for us today, Abraham is exhibit A of a man who pulled himself up by his own bootstraps and was justified by his works. You're maybe not familiar with Jewish literature at the time of the New Testament, but Jewish literature in Paul's day gave exactly that message that Abraham was saved because he was that good. The apocryphal book of Jubilees says this about Abraham. He was perfect in all his deeds with the Lord and well-pleasing in righteousness all the days of his life. First Maccabees, another apocryphal book, takes it for granted that Abraham was a good man. Says, was not Abraham found faithful when tested and it was reckoned to him as righteousness? So he was tested, he proved himself, that's why he's righteous. Or in the book of Sirach, another apocryphal book, Abraham was the great father of a multitude of nations, and no one has been found like him in glory. He kept the law of the Most High and entered into a covenant with him. He certified the covenant in his flesh, and when he was tested, he proved faithful. In fact, so perfect was Abraham thought to be that in another Jewish book, the prayer of Manasseh, it concluded that Abraham had never needed to repent of anything. You, O Lord, God of the righteous, have not appointed repentance for the righteous, for Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, who did not sin against you. That's the context into which Paul is giving this message that we are saved by faith alone without works. These are some kind of claims that are being made. First of all, that Abraham performed the whole law before it was even written. That he was secondly perfect in all of his deeds. And thirdly, that he had no need for repentance ever. So the conclusion is, obviously, Abraham is justified by being a good man, by working hard, and so he's an example for all of us to follow. That's how you get saved. Case closed. And Paul says, not so fast. Verse 3, take a look. Verse 3, what does Scripture say? And before we go any further, we've got to stop right there for just a pause. What does Scripture say? We need to soak in these words of Paul and his approach here. 
See, Paul sees the whole Old Testament all the way back to the beginning, not as a relic, not as 39 books that are nothing more than history to satisfy our curiosity. Paul sees our Old Testament as one book with one unified message written by different authors, but always written as they were being led by the living God who was revealing himself to them and carrying them along the way as they wrote his words, giving to them his living and active word. In fact, notice in verse 3, notice what he doesn't say. Paul doesn't say, what did the scriptures say? He asks, what do the scriptures say. This is not past tense. This is present. What do the scriptures say? Do you see what that means for us Christians? It means that this is no dead historical record. This is God's living word. And what Paul is doing in using the written word of God as the authority in answering our questions about God's will, God's ways, whatever God has inspired to be written on these pages, Old Testament and New, Paul is saying this is the authority for believers. You have a question about how you're saved? What do the scriptures say? This is what the great Scottish reformer John Knox used to say. When I read my Bible... I'm going to the mouth of God and listening to what he has to say. I'm going to the mouth of God when I go to my Bible and listening for his voice because that's where he speaks to me. And so I got a question for you. Is that your pattern, Christian? When it comes to what do you believe? How do you live your life? How do you understand God and his ways? What's your authority? It is so tempting in our day to find somebody trustworthy, seems to be trustworthy on social media, to follow them, an influencer of truth, to follow what they say and understand your world and your faith through their words. Or to listen to a podcast, a lot of our young adults, young people listen to podcasts. There's some really good ones there. Oh, but may your word of authority be no less than the word of God because it alone comes from his mouth and it alone will guide you faithfully and without fail through the labyrinth of decisions you need to make in your life. What do the scriptures say? Well, what do they say? In dealing with this question, how are we saved? Paul goes all the way back to the very first book of our Old Testament to make this point. Verse 3, what do the scriptures say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, if you're not aware, he's quoting there directly from the book of Genesis, from Genesis 15 and verse 6. It says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. What Paul's saying here is, don't you understand, friends? You question, how can you be saved if not by works? Don't you understand that your own spiritual father was saved not by bringing his works to the table with God, but by believing God, by faith alone was he saved? In fact, Jesus said much the same thing. Why don't you take your Bibles, turning them to the New Testament Gospel of John. John chapter 8. Jesus being confronted by skeptical Jews who claim privileged status as Abraham's children, so they don't need to trust in him. They're rejecting Jesus as their savior, even as they claimed Abraham as their father. The account is in John chapter 8, verses 39 and 40. And they're bragging, Abraham is our father. What does Jesus say? John 8, 39 and 40. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. In other words, you would believe in me like he did. And he makes that very specific. If you look down at verse 56 of John chapter 8, John 8 verse 56, Jesus said, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. Did you catch that? Abraham 2,000 years B.C., your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day 
He saw it and was glad. Uh, Abraham got it, is what Jesus is saying. The only way that he could stand before a holy God was by believing in God's promises, not by his works, not by his perfection. And he didn't just believe God. It's more than that. Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day, Jesus says. He saw my day and was glad. He's saying that Abraham may have only seen it in the great, vast distance. He may have seen it only through a fog. But 2,000 years before God took on human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, the man Abraham trusted in God's way of bringing salvation to needy humans. The way that God worked that salvation out developed over time. There is a progress in revelation. But it was always by faith. And it was always depending on that great sacrifice that was to come, that God would provide for his people, whether Adam and Eve or Noah or Abraham or Moses or the prophets. They were all looking for a righteousness to be provided for them from outside. So Paul takes Genesis, the very passage that his critics who say, you got to work to be saved, the very passage they would use and point to Abraham and say, this is how you got to obey God. Jesus, uh, Paul takes that passage and turns it upside down. Now let's take a look at Genesis chapter 15. Rather than talking about it, let's go right to the source. Genesis chapter 15. As you're turning there, let me, you may not know this, but Genesis chapter 15, 6 is the very first time that the word believe occurs in Scripture. And also, even more so, that it's connected with attaining righteousness. It's one of the very few times in the Old Testament that this connection is made. Now, in order to get the full impact of Abraham's faith, you've got to frame Genesis 15 in its context. Abraham has just come off of a multi national military victory in which he and 318 men from his own household had rescued his nephew Lot and defeated four mighty kings and their armies in battle. It it was an amazing miracle of God's grace and a mighty show of power on Abraham's part. And after that great victory, a lot like Elijah after his great victory on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal, Abraham was suffering a post-victory breakdown, an emotional letdown. He's drifting off to sleep one late afternoon, early evening, mind clouded over with weary negativism, his thoughts reflecting on his life thus far, remembering how he had been there minding his own business in the cosmopolitan city of Ur, hundreds and hundreds of miles away. He had no children at the time, but he did have a comfortable life and a beautiful wife to help numb his pain. But then the God of the universe stepped into his life, told him to leave everything behind, get up and go. Didn't even tell him where he was taking him, just get up and go. And he would let him know when he arrived there. Well, he promised to take this 75-year-old barren man, well, barren wife and the man he, who was married to her and turn them into a great nation that would in turn be his agent to bless the entire world. Well, Abraham got up, he followed. Not perfectly, but he, he followed God's call. And now he's been in the promised land for 10 years now. He's wealthy, he's a military hero after these latest exploits. He's got so much, and yet so what? He still has no heir to carry on the family line. So here he drifts off to sleep in the fog of discouragement, and it's right then that God speaks to him in a vision. Genesis 15, verse 1. Take a look there. 15, verse 1, God speaks. Fear not, Abraham. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Rousing words but they're not enough to cheer up discouraged Abraham. He reminds God of his situation, just in case he's forgotten. Genesis 15, verse 2, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. 
Verse 3, and Abraham said, Behold, you've given me no offspring. Oh, those are great promises you're repeating, but I still have no child. And it's right at this point that the Lord reaffirms and clarifies his promise from years before. Verse 4 of Genesis 15, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man, Eliezer of Damascus, this man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. In verse 5, and he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven. Number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And this is where Abraham finds his righteousness with God. How? Verse 6 of Genesis 15, and he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. That's it. That's how Abraham reached salvation. He believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. You see how Paul, right in that verse, smashes the idea that the hero Abraham was ever an example of getting yourself savable by a holy God by doing enough good things. He does it using the very scripture that focuses on Abraham, the very first book of the whole scripture. You cannot go further back than that. Salvation by Abraham was by faith alone. Sola fide. That's it. And in verses 4 and 5, Paul illustrates the point. Now, oh, back to Romans 4, I should say. Back to Romans 4, verses 4 and 5. Look back there, and we'll pick it up in verse 4. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And we all understand that instinctively. You work, you get paid. You get paid because you've earned the pay, it's owed to you. It's interesting to see some of our young adults beginning careers, some of our young people getting first jobs, and some of you are excited. It's the, it's the first, it's the first job, either part-time or it's the first job of your new career, and you're especially excited when you get your first paycheck until you open it up and you see how much is taken off in taxes and everything else, but you're still pretty excited. Money's finally coming in after so long. But as excited as you are, I have yet to see a single young person, young adult, get their first paycheck, run to their boss, fall on their knees, and say, thank you for your kind generosity. Nobody does that. You worked for that money. You worked hard. You are owed that payment. And what does the Bible say about Abraham? Verse 2 reminds us that if he was justified by what he did, then he does have something to boast about, but not before God. In other words, it's ludicrous before God. It's ludicrous to think that this man has anything to stand on or boast about in the presence of the holy God of heaven. No human being can ever put the sovereign God of the universe in his or her debt. You can't work like that. But verse 5, and to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. But the one who doesn't work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Here it is, friends. You are justified by faith. It's rock, world rocking. Now, we just finished going through the story of Abraham's life at the beginning of the summer. I hope that you remember at least some of what we saw as we journeyed through that story. You remember God calls Abraham, as we just talked about, out of this idol worship in an idol-worshiping pagan nation, makes promises to bless him, to be a blessing to the world. And no sooner does Abraham hear the promise of God and head out, what happens? Remember, he falls into fear, a famine hits the promised land. 
Abraham's terrified. He leaves the land of promise behind, not trusting that God can provide for him there. He heads down into Egypt with his wife, and then he's terrified of Pharaoh because his wife is so beautiful that he tells Pharaoh that this is his sister. And in so doing, Abraham almost works and schemes his way right out of God's promises. And it's not the last time he does something like that. Well, the old habits, they die hard, don't they? So when Paul points in verse 5 of Romans 4 to the ungodly who God justifies by faith as a gift, he's not just pointing to any of us. He's pointing all the way back to Abraham himself. The man was not perfect. In God's eyes, he was ungodly. And yet his faith is counted as righteousness. It's all about faith, friends. Now, what does it mean to have faith, though? We need to make sure we get it. We're almost at the end here, but we need to make sure we understand what it is to trust, to have faith in Jesus Christ, because there are many wrong ideas about saving faith floating around. And if they lead you away from the truth, then they are deadly. So let's make sure we're clear on two things that faith is not. Saving faith is not just giving a nod and intellectual agreement to what God says. Abraham wasn't put right with God by his actions, but his faith did lead him to action. He didn't say, Lord, Lord, I believe you can make this barren couple, my wife and I, into a great nation. I believe that you can bless the whole world through us, as unlikely as it seems. I believe it. He didn't say that and then fail to contact a real estate agent in Ur to sell his house for him. He left his family, left his homeland, headed to a place he didn't know, and he did it in faith because he believed That's saving faith. His faith led him to go into battle against foreign kings, led him to hand over the best of his land to his selfish nephew. His faith led him to intercede, a lonely, desperate prayer, standing face to face with God, as it were, begging for mercy on Sodom and Gomorrah, that God wouldn't destroy righteous people along with the wicked for the sake of his name. And Abraham's faith in God's trustworthy power and plan led him to follow God in obedience, even on Mount Moriah, when it would almost cost him the life of his own precious child of promise after all of those years of waiting. True faith is like that, Abraham's faith, active, wholehearted trust and commitment. That's what true faith is. Another thing that faith is not, (coughs) faith is also not a remedial kind of work. A work that God gives for those of us who can't quite get it done. Some of us know what it's like to struggle in school, some more than others. At least some of you know what it's like to struggle in school. Maybe you didn't make the grade. Maybe you ended up in remedial math. Maybe you had to face the purgatory of spending your summer in summer school. You know the trials of not quite being able to make the grade. My struggle was French, actually. My struggle was French in high school. And honestly, I don't think it was because of a lack of intelligence. Honestly, I didn't care for my French teacher very much. I also lived in BC, and I didn't see the relevance of French for my life all the way out here in BC when all the French people were back in Quebec. And I also had basketball to live for in junior high school. So when grade 11 came and high school began, I couldn't take French 11. And that was a problem that I hadn't foreseen. The problem is you needed a French course or some other uh, uh, authorized language to graduate from high school back then. And I didn't know anything else. French was the closest I had to a second language and I didn't know that very well. So what was I supposed to do? Well, lucky for me, there was a class that I did qualify for in high school, a class that did meet the requirements for a foreign language. It was beginner's French 11. 
Not normal French, beginner's French. And that was, that was perfect because even though I didn't pay much attention to French, I had had years of taking it in school. So even though I didn't like it, I remembered enough of French through the years that I was able to ace French 11 as long as it was beginner's French 11. Now, too many people see faith like that, salvation by faith. They see it as if God has given us his law to obey originally. Here's the Ten Commandments. Obey them and you will live. And then we royally mess that up. We prove utterly incapable of keeping his requirements. So what does he do then? Well, you can't get the job done by obeying me. So, so how about if I lower the standards instead? Forget keeping the Ten Commandments. How about if we just dumb it all the way down and just believe in Jesus? That'll be good enough. That's all the work I'll ask of you. If you can manage to work up some faith, then I'll accept that as your work. So many people see salvation by faith like that as if it's an easier kind of work that we can manage ourselves, but that is not what salvation by faith is. It is not God's plan B. It's not salvation for dummies that tur turns faith into a work that gives us something to boast about if we can muster up enough of it to get ourselves faithfully in Christ. No, Paul makes that very clear. Chapter 3, verse 27, boasting is excluded. Verse 2 of chapter 4, Abraham had nothing to boast about before God. Your faith in mine, in Jesus Christ, brings no merit to us, gives no reason for boasting. Verses 24 and 25 of chapter 3, we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Let's be clear on this, friends. Faith saves nobody. Your faith doesn't save you. Jesus Christ saves all who will be saved by his finished work. He saves its pure gift, and faith is simply the God-ordained means of surrendering everything in your hand to grab hold of the gift and appropriate the finished work of Jesus Christ for yourself. Why? So that God gets all the glory and we get all the joy. As Sinclair Ferguson puts it, the empty hand of faith takes hold of Christ and says, I can't bring anything in my hand, only you can save me. That's what faith is. It's saying there is nothing I can do, only you can save me. And that's what Paul is saying in verse 5 of Romans chapter 4. To the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Okay, sorry, I led you a little wrong before. I said we were almost finished before, and now I've spoken for a few minutes. I hate when preachers do that, don't you? Lull you into a false sense of hope that we're almost done. We are this time. We're almost done for this morning. I promise you this time. But we can't be fully done, we can't wrap it up until we understand what Paul means when he says at the end of verse 5 that faith is counted as righteousness. Abraham believed God and his faith was counted by God as righteousness. What does that mean, counted? The Greek word logizomai, it appears 11 times in this chapter alone. And it's got the idea of crediting to somebody's account. And that's clear despite the fact that some different translations uh, translated in ways like counted it, reckoned, considered, imputed, computed. Whatever your translation says, they all mean that righteousness was credited to Abraham's account because of his faith, not because of his works. And this concept of crediting righteousness it's called in Protestant theology, forensic justification. 
or synthetic justification. I know this is a Sunday morning, and those are pretty big, deep words, technical theological terms, especially if you're not a Bible college or a seminary student. But forensic justification, synthetic justification, they're very understandable. Let me explain them to you. Where do you hear the word forensic in common language? You, have, you hear it in the legal world. It has to do with legal declarations. You've got forensic accounting. So when we talk about forensic justification, we're referring to the fact that God makes a legal declaration about those who believe. When a person believes in Jesus Christ, puts their whole trust in his finished work as their only hope, God legally declares that that person is now just. That person is righteous just by their belief alone. Ah, so the Roman Catholics come along. They see this point that the Protestants make and they protest. (laughs) The Catholics protest the Protestants. One of the reasons that the Protestant doctrine has been rejected by Rome historically is that Rome sees this idea of God looking at a sinner and simply because of their faith, he declares them righteous. Roman Catholicism thinks that's a legal fiction. That makes a liar out of God. How can God call people righteous or just when they are in fact not righteous? They've done nothing to make themselves righteous. How can he say that about them? Isn't that a lie? Isn't that a legal fiction? And if God, true, if he went around arbitrarily declaring unrighteous people to be righteous, that would be an, a falsehood. That would be a legal fiction. It would cast a shadow on the integrity of God. Well, the debate between Rome and Protestantism often hinges on two words. I'll tell you them and then we'll wrap up. Imputed is one word. Infused is the other word. They both refer to how God makes us just or righteous. Roman Catholics teach that In order to make sinful people righteous, God really needs to give righteousness to them. He has to make them truly righteous. And so in baptism, according to the Roman Catholic Church, righteousness is infused by the act of baptizing. It's kind of injected like intravenous into the soul. You've got to infuse real righteousness in there, and then if you sin, that's why you keep making use of the sacraments to keep the righteousness flowing in your veins. And if you commit a mortal sin, then you're off the team and you've got to start all over again. But that's not what the Bible says. All the way back in Genesis, Paul is making this point. God's Word tells us that when a person believes in Christ, The righteousness of Christ is credited to him, not infused, but imputed to him. The argument of Protestant theology, friends, is that the transfer of the merit of Christ to the account of the believer is a real transfer. It's not a legal fiction because it's real merit, Christ's merit but transferred into the believer's account so that when God looks at that person who has trusted in Jesus Christ, he sees that unrighteous person, but now covered with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. No longer the sinner that you still are at heart, but transformed because Christ has accomplished your salvation. He earned a righteousness we could not earn. He paid the price we could not afford to pay. And now his glorious robes of righteousness clothe you, Christian, if you have put your trust in his finished work and you rest in him without your own works. So here we are, All of us born into this world, born as sinners on the brink of hell. Not sinners because we sin, but we sin because we are born in that state of sin which we inherited from Adam and Eve. We are facing an eternity without God because how can a righteous God have fellowship with people like us? We are under his condemnation and how do we escape? How do we escape? 
How can we get right with God? How can we be forgiven? How can we be acquitted? How can we be counted as righteous in his presence rather than condemned to hell? Every other religion says, try a little harder. Do a little more. Keep working. Keep working. Find out the new rules and follow those rules and maybe, maybe, maybe at the end of the day, maybe you might get in. The Bible says, Christian theology says, you are saved without works by faith alone, by trusting in the one who justifies the ungodly. See what that means for us, friends. Christ died to pay our debt. Christ lived to provide our righteousness. And when we despair of ourselves, there are people here I know in despair of yourselves, you want to be so much more than you are right now. Well, when you despair of yourselves, but trust in the God who justifies the ungodly, God reckons your sin as punished on that cross of Jesus Christ. And he reckons you every bit as righteous as his son. Thanks be to him for his glorious grace. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for your word. We live in a world, in a society where there is so much error, where there is so much being offered that cannot truly save nor satisfy. You've given your word to us as truth to point us to who you really are, to your true plan of salvation. And you have given us Jesus Christ. How can it be? Well, thank you for your love. Thank you for your indescribable gift. And I pray this morning that if there are any within the sound of my voice who have not known what it is to lay down their efforts to stop the wearying toil and to simply humble themselves at the foot of the cross and accept from your finished work through Jesus Christ his glorious robes of righteousness that truly transform us, Lord, would you bring them to that place of surrender? Would you bring salvation to this place? And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Team, would you come and lead us?